Hi, this is Orion, and you're listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories Podcast. Well, I have a number of short stories and fairy tales here. For the next little while, I'll be sharing a large chapter book with you. Illusion by Paula Volsky. For 200 years, the exalted classes have ruled over Vonar by virtue of their dazzling magical abilities. Now, their powers grown slack from disuse, they concentrate on the pleasures their station affords them, ignoring the misery of the lower classes. It is only when the red tide of revolution sweeps aside all distinctions of rank, home, and family that the exalted realize the gravity of their mistake. Thrust into the very center of the conflict is the beautiful Elise Faux de Raval, spirited daughter of a provincial landowner. Now, like those she disdained, she must scramble for bread in the teeming streets of the capital city, the key to her abilities and elusive secret, and find a way to survive in a world gone mad with liberty. Orion's Bedtime Stories is proudly brought to you by Anchor FM. And if you've not heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Firstly, it is free, and they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Then they distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. So you have everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Hello and welcome to Orion's Bedtime Stories. This time I'm reading a chapter book titled Illusion by Paula Volsky. This is chapter one. When one of the serfs was caught with a bundle of seditious pamphlets in his pocket, the Marquis Vauderaval was understandably infuriated. Bad enough that a serf should be reading at all, for literacy overburdened the menial mind, resulting in mental and moral injury. That the pamphleteer in question should prove none other than the execrable Republican Chorvinirien, whose writings the Marquis had specifically prescribed, was doubly offensive, and it was more than certain that the culprit, a feather-headed young dreamer by the name of Zen Subasan, was in serious trouble. Even now, Zen was locked up in the stable, awaiting interrogation and the inevitable punishment. If he escaped with less than a dozen stripes, he'd be lucky. Before sunset, the lad's fate would be decided. In the meantime, crazed speculation ran rife among the field workers and house servants. The Marquis Vauderval's daughter, Elise, might never have troubled her head over such a matter, had it not been for the extraordinary attitude of her maidservant, Steli Zeno's girl. Sullen and lackadaisical, with an expressionless nonchalance sometimes skirting the edge of insolence, Steli at the best of times was no prize. And now, since the news of Zen's arrest reached the chateau, she'd waxed utterly incompetent. Within the space of two hours, she had broken a vial of perfume, overturned a jar of powder on the vanity, torn the lace on a morning negligee, and botched her mistress's coiffure so abominably that Elise, in despair, was forced to liberate the glittering mass of fair curls which now hung loose and unfettered as a child's. It was really too tiresome. And yet Elise, regarding herself... And yet at least, regarding herself in the gold-framed vanity mirror, was forced to admit that the juvenile style suited her very well. Her hair was certainly one of her chief beauties, and what better way than this to display its enviable sheen and extravagant length. Moreover, the curly tendrils spilling over a clear white forehead somehow emphasized the changeable luster of the largest pair of thick-lashed gray eyes in the entire province, if not in all the land of Vonar. 
At seventeen, passionately loath to play the ingenue, she aimed for sophistication. For all of that, there could be no denying. The effect of those great that great honey cloud faming her heart-shaped face was delightful. She would let it stay that way, at least for the rest of the day. Perhaps the sulky jade Steli had done her a good turn, if only by accident. The mirror reflected most of the sunlit bedchamber in all its disorder. Open boxes and trunks stood scattered about the floor. The armchairs and window seat were heaped high with gowns, petticoats, fichus, shawls and manteaux, scarves, feathers and ribbons. Hat boxes stood piled against one wall. Silk and wooden stockings, woolen stockings dangled from the open bureau drawer. Fans and gloves cluttered the escritoire. Shoes and boots and chopines lay underfoot. Snowdrifts of crumpled tissue paper rose in the corners. It was another week before Elise was scheduled to depart for the capital city of Sherine to take her place at court as a maid of honor to the queen, but packing was a protracted affair, one for which Steli, as usual, displayed neither aptitude nor enthusiasm. Even as Elise look on, looked on, the maid crushed a thin muslin nightgown into a tiny ball, which she thrust by main force into the depths of a two-full trunk. Elise stiffened with an irritation disproportionate to the offense. It would have been different had she not been so certain that the other girl, but a few years her senior, was deliberately destructive. It was one thing to know, quite another to prove. If taxed, Steli would doubtless plead in his inadvertence in that monosyllabic, elusively impertinent manner of hers. The thing was impossible to verify, and in any case, really beneath notice. Taking a deep breath, the Marquise's daughter addressed her maid with studied composure. Not there, girl. Take it out, fold it, and put in another box. With a barely perceptible shrug, Steli obeyed. Every movement a wordless insult. She sauntered across the room, treading on scattered garments as she went. An ivory fan cracked beneath her heel. Take care, Claude Hopper! The exclamation burst from Elise, and she regretted it immediately, for she, like many of the more progressive among the exalted class, deemed it cruel to reproach inferiors for the limitations of intellect and ability imposed by nature. Steli, however, appeared unmoved. The thick-skinned, dull insensitivity of her kind armored her against insult, or so it appeared. In which case, what in the world accounted for the maidservant's chronic ill-humor? Surely the girl, who owed her present comfortable situation solely to the high esteem in which her brother Dreff was held by the Vauderaval family, ought to appreciate her own singular good fortune. How could she be so stupidly ungrateful? Occasionally at least wondered. Steli slouched to the bureau and began to sort through the jumble, tossing hairpins and jewelry around with minimal efficiency and maximal clatter. Presently, she dropped the curling iron, perhaps by accident, perhaps not, and the implement hit the floor with a solid thunk. Elise started, jaw muscles tightening. Deliberately, she relaxed, striving to suppress all annoyance. In that instant, she realized that what she felt exceeded mere irritation, amounting to actual dislike, which was clearly inappropriate. One might reprimand a clumsy or incompetent servant, one might express displeasure or dissatisfaction, but one did not stoop to personal animosity. Curiously, the reverse did not hold true. An easy, pleasant condescension marked good breeding. Many of Elise's friends and family members liked certain individual serfs and servants, sometimes even regarded them with warmth bordering upon real affection. 
She herself liked Stelly's brother Dreff immensely, and always had. She liked him so much, in fact, that she would be sorry, yes, actually sorry, to leave him behind in a week's time. She might even miss him a little. Did that, as she sometimes suspected, carry liking too far, perhaps to the verge of absurdity? No, certainly not. Dreff pleased her, but she was equally fond of Hussy, the red satin mare that she rode nearly every morning. She would miss beautiful Hussy. Likewise, she was fond of Prince Vauplume, the modishly min minute lapdog that she intended to carry with her to Shireen. There was nothing ridiculous in such affections. They were indicative, in fact, of the tender, if wholly artificial, sensibility appropriate to marriageable daughters of the exalted class. The gush of fashionable sentiment, however, remained at all times suitably channeled, dam dam damned as required by standards of behavior, precluding so much as an instant's forgetfulness of the vast gulf existing between exalted and all other mortals. Aristocratic education notwithstanding, at least personally disliked her maid. Having consciously recognized that fact at last, the mental response was prompt. I will not take that sour slattern with me to Shireen, she thought. I'll get another one and train her. That little wench Carith, perhaps, in the dairy. She looks bright and pleasant. She should do. I hope Dreff wouldn't be too disappointed that I don't want his sister. If he is, too bad. The jade has been given every fair chance. Having reached this decision, her mood improved at once. Stelly was still jangling brooches and bracelets. Had she not bothered to pick up the fallen she had not bothered to pick up the fallen curling iron. Knowledge that the other's blighting presence was but temporary enabled Elise to speak pleasantly. Put that aside for now, girl. Come here and brush my hair. Stelly dropped a handful of jewelry. One of the bracelets rolled off the bureau and onto the floor. She ignored it. In silence, she crossed to the vanity, took up the brush, and attacked her mistress's hair as if raking burrs from the tail of a plow horse. Elise endured the punishment in silence for a time. At last, a particularly vicious tug yanked her head backwards so violently that a cry of angry pain was wrung from her. "'You stupid, clumsy slut! Get out of here before I slap you!' Instantly, Elise colored to the roots of her hair. Never before had she spoken so to an inferior. She was always kind to animals and serfs, and she entertained great contempt for women who beat their servants without good cause. In yelling and threatening, she violated her own standards of behavior and was correspondingly ashamed. Stelly seemed neither frightened nor offended. Rather, her black brows rose slightly, and her lips curled in the satisfaction of confirmed expectation. She laid the hairbrush on the vanity with elaborate care. Ridiculous, absurd, humiliating to engage in a contest of wills with an insolent service, servant as if she were an equal. Surely the liberality of such so-called enlightened modern philosophers as Rizras Zamu and Stivo Juvel, who prated of human fraternity and universal education, was never meant to include recalcitrant menials. The puerile rantings of renegade lawyers and journalists like Carrie Dell or the dangerous Shorvi Narien, who openly called for the restriction of traditional exalted privilege, surely these things inspired entertaining debate with house guests in the quiet hour before dinner. But they were stimulating intellectual exercises, nothing more. And what had they to do with reality? The real world held no place for such impracticality. Stelly hadn't gone yet. She was still standing there, feet planted firmly, arms akinbo, a stance expressing a graceless, dogged determination. Was she deaf as well as disagreeable? Didn't you hear me, girl? Elise could rare 
could rarely bring herself to pronounce the other's name. Get out. Go busy yourself elsewhere. Tell the housekeeper to find you something to do. This was a deliberate insult. A lady's maid was never expected to lower herself to the level of the ordinary household servants. An angry tirade could scarcely have expressed Elise's disappropriate disapprobation more forcefully, but as always, Stelly seemed indifferent. Incredibly, she did not move. Still, she stood there, staring at her mistress's face in the mirror. Elise's brows drew together, and her cheeks flushed. Given the provocation, she had proved patient. At this point, however, additional indulgence could only be interpreted as weakness, which ought never be displayed. Serfs were notoriously quick to exploit the weakness of their masters, but they were calmer and actually happier when ruled with a firm hand. At least drew a deep breath, but the reprimand died unspoken on her lips as she met her servant's reflected gaze. Stelly's eyes, dark as obsidian and usually about as expressive, now blazed with an odd mixture of defiance and something that almost seemed like fear. The expression was so startling that Elise forgot her anger. "'What is the matter with you?' she asked, kindly enough. Stelly, fully prepared to withstand verbal assault, was taken unaware by the unusual forbearance. Scally, scowling and uncertain, she folded her arms. "'Come, what is it?' Elise persisted, curiosity aroused. Stelly hesitated. The olive-skinned face beneath was frilled mob cap. Beneath the frilled mob cap, ordinarily so impassive, now reflected conflicting emotions. Elise waited expectantly, and at last the maid replied with an effort. It's Zen, miss. As always, she pronounced the honorific with perceptible reluctance. Who? Zen Subasan. My lord, the Marquis has Zen locked up in the stable. What will happen to him now? Oh, the boy caught with the pamphlets? Is that who you mean? Stelly nodded. Well, Elise shrugged. He'll be punished, no doubt. He certainly deserves it. Deserves? He disobeyed my father's orders. What's more, he must have done so quite intentionally. The Marquis can hardly let that pass, can he? What will be done to Zen? Oh! Perceiving the other's concern, Elise responded with easy compassion. Nothing too dreadful. Perhaps a few stripes, scarcely more. Father is no barbarian. The lad need hardly fear for his limbs. Her reassurance was more than rhetorical. In an earlier, more violent age, erring serfs were commonly subject to mutilation and dismemberment. Times had changed, however, and the current enlightened generation of the exalted limited corporal punishment to flogging, kicking, and the pillory, except in extreme cases. Stelly seemed to have trouble translating her feelings to words. At last she replied, with evident difficulty, Zen mustn't be beaten. It won't be so bad. It will be over quickly, and then his slate will be clean. No, he mustn't be beaten. What? Are you saying he's innocent? Yes, innocent. That's right. Foolery. He was caught carrying Narian's scribblings. How do you account for that? It's only paper and ink. You shouldn't be beaten for such a trifle. Don't you understand the principle involved? My father has banned Narian's writings from his estate. Your friend Zen was willfully disobeyed, and that is why he must be punished. He won't really be hurt, and if this teaches him to behave himself, then everyone will be better for it. Can't you see that? Zen done's, no Zen's done nothing so bad. Stelly's grasp of principle appeared weak. He mustn't be beaten. He can't bear it. Well, I'm afraid he'll have to. If he's a bright lad, then he'll learn his lesson, and there's an end to the affair. No one will hold a grudge against him. You don't understand. What do you say to me? 
Again, Elise's astonishment overcame anger at the servant's remarkable impudence. You don't understand. Zen mustn't be beaten. He can't bear it. He isn't strong. He isn't like most of us. He can't endure abuse. A abuse? You don't know what you're saying. Really, you are stupid. No doubt. Well, you're the smart one here. Miss. A touch of sarcasm? Would she dare? It was unclear, and in any case, too trivial to bother about. What I'm saying is, Zen's always been kind of puny, Stelly continued with unwanted expansiveness. He's skinny, he's got a weak stomach, he can't take the heat in the fields, and he gets these fainting fits. The details are unnecessary. He's sort of weak, and not meant to take a beating. And I've been thinking. Clearly it was difficult for Stelly to ask for anything, but the cause overcame her reluctance, and she continued stoically. I've been thinking that you might ask your father to go easy on Zen. Will you, miss? Well, I don't know. It might not be quite so simple as that. Intrigued by the novelty, at least swung around in her chair to face her servant. To begin with, father's angry and not all that likely to heed my advice. Beyond that, I'm not quite certain this is right. It might be best in the long run that the boy learn his lesson now. He's learned it, miss. He's learned it. You may be certain of that. You sound very definite. Do you know him so well, then? He is my intended. Ah, at least regarded her, ma her maid with interest. It would seem that the sullen Steli was human after all, and the rush of surprised cordial cordiality at the discovery threatened to overwhelm old hostility. I didn't know you were promised. Zen and I came to terms about eight weeks ago, miss. Last week the steward handed down his lordship's permission, and I thought our troubles were over. And now this— Stelly's habitual insolence was expediently diminished. For the moment, at least, she looked and sounded almost winsome. Zen's got no harm in him. He's just a dreamer. He wants looking after. Well, I never guessed. Elise's sympathies were now fully engaged. We must see what we can do about this. You'll speak up for Zen, miss? Gladly. A sunrise smile lighted the servant's face. She looked years younger when she smiled, and Elise added, You mustn't rejoice too soon, Stelly. Father's annoyed, and he might not listen to me, but I'll do my best. That much I can promise. No one could ask for more, miss. It's good of you. It truly is. Stelly was unmistakably surprised. It's very good. With you and my brother both to speak to both to speak up, Zen's bowed to come out of this healthy. Your brother? What's Dreff to do with all this? He's promised to talk to the Marquis. Oh, that's a bad idea. He'd better not do that. Why, Dreff's a real good talker. Indeed he is. Few better. But now isn't the time. You see, the fact is— it was extraordinary to explain matters to a servant, but somehow seemed appropriate in this case. My father is now feeling that literacy among you people ought to be discouraged, or perhaps forbidden altogether. It's too late in Dreff's case, of course. Dreff's been reading almost as long as I have. Longer, Stelly mouthed the word almost silently, unconsciously. But there's no point in reminding the Marquis of that just now. It would only make things worse. Best to keep Dreff out of this for the moment. You understand me? Very well, miss, but I'm afraid it's too late. Elise's brows arched, and Stelly added, Dreff's set to put his voice in with the Marquis. He's already on his way. He'll be here any moment. Automatically, Elise rose and stepped toward the window, then stopped as she realized her error. Her bedroom was at the front of the house, its windows affording a view of the manicured lawn and the long, tree-lined drive leading to the grand front entrance, entrance reserved for family members and visitors of rank. 
Dreff would go to the back door, of course, his approach invisible from her present vantage point. She turned back, lifting her eyes to Stelly's face. Elise was moderately tall, but the other girl towered above her by half a head, an unusual circumstance in a land where physical height commonly denoted correspondingly high birth. Moreover, Stelly was strapping and almost majestic, erect of carriage, broad-shouldered, strong, and so heroically proportioned that Elise's slender form seemed almost insubstantial by comparison. It was vaguely offensive that a servant should look down upon her mistress from such an imperial height. It was more than presumptuous. It was somehow threatening, at least in Stelly's case. But at least was not thinking of that now. Run down to the kitchen, Nat. Run down to the kitchen door, she directed. When you see Dreff, tell him to go away. No, wait, she changed her mind before Stelly had taken a step. "'You stay here and mend my gown you tore. "'I'll tell him myself.' "'Without another word, she turned and hurried from the room. "'After a moment, Stelly quietly followed. "'Through her disordered sitting-room sped Elise, "'ignoring the plaintive yaps of Prince Vauplume, "'out into the corridor whose ancient wall-hangings, "'remnant of a medial medieval past depicted the warlike deeds of the made vo de mailed Vauderaval ancestors. Down the dog-legged stairway, with its dark bulbous balustrade, heavily carved and fluted in the manner of the past century, through chambers of old-fashioned, agreeably battered size and comfort, along the uncarpeted pass-through to the vast kitchen unchanged for generations, without regard for the startled stares of the lounging scullions, and thence through the mud closet and out onto the old stone landing through upon which the servants were wont to promenade when the rainy season transformed lane and path into rivers of mud. It was not rainy season now. It was early summer, and the hot, dusty air hazed softly over the Daraval fields, pastures, and vineyards. For weeks now, the weather had been fine. The roads between the chateau and the city of Shireen were now quite dry, an optimal condition for Elise's impending journey by coach. And that was as it should be. For surely it was only right and proper that nature accommodated herself as required to the needs of the exalted, her own most favored children. Elise gazed south across the level green lawn bounded by an undisciplined boxwood hedge. Beyond, behind the hedge lay the flower gardens, and beyond the gardens the fields began, the cultivated rows stretching on as far as the eye could see. To the southeast, a stand of Daraval timber rose, the tall trunks masking the green-brown fish pond. On the far side of the pond, quite invisible from the house, a cluster of cottages inhabited by the serfs, and then the thickly forested hills, a picturesque and mysterious realm, reputedly the haunt of brigands, ghouls, and renegade magicians, and beyond the and beyond doubt, the site of Uncle Quince's rustic hermitage. The popular philosopher Rees Ross Zemu claimed that man in a natural setting manifested his noblest qualities. Such theories appeared vindicated by the quint by the existence of Quinsvo Derival, sweetest and most unworldly of exalted recluses. It was said that Quinze's mastery of the traditional forms of exalted magic was extraordinary, almost unparalleled. Elise could not have answered for that, for she never thought about it. But she knew beyond doubt that he was loving and lovable, kind, naive as a child was commonly supposed to be, and sometimes capable of truly entertaining magical tricks. The Southwest view was less, in less inspiring. There could be seen the neat, sturdy outbuildings, stables, carriage house, spring house, smoke house, hen house, dairy, and so forth, the vineyards and winery, and then the long, rutted road leading down the slope to the dull little village inhabited by peasants, owing their feudal duties to the Marquise Vauderval. A static scene, 
save for the soaring birds and the tiny mannequin figures of the serfs laboring in the distant wheat fields. And then through the gap in the hedge broke a t- broke a tall, lean figure, and Elise's blood quickened in pleasurable anticipation. Silly. But then, Dref Zenosun had always had that effect upon her, absurd though it was. Well, perhaps not so absurd, after all. Dref was amusing, beyond doubt. A serf possessed of such freakish quickness and cleverness was surely worthy of unusual regard. It was because of that mental agility that he had been her companion since earliest childhood. Hers, if not his, as he was the older. Some fourteen years earlier, just at the time that Elise's education commenced, the remarkable abilities of the ten-year-old Dref Zinnison had been directed to the notice of the Marquis of Oderval. Dref, it was noted, could add, subtract, divide, and multiply sickeningly long columns of figures in his head, producing the correct sum within seconds. Never mind the fact that serfs lacked the logic for mathematics, he could do it. When shown a scene, or a collection of objects, he could later describe what he had seen with an accuracy, leaving no doubt that he viewed concrete images within his mind. Before he was three, he knew his letters, and more important, understood their application. He learned to read almost upon instinct, it seemed, and he remembered all that he had read. Before he was seven, he had acquired a penknife, and used it to carve out the interlocking parts of little wooden machines powered by wind and water. He could play the flute, the harmonica, the ocarina, the fuge, and the glass organ like a son of the exalted. He made up tunes, wrote them down according to his own system of notation, then played them upon a variety of instruments. He could sculpt in clay and plaster, paint in watercolor and tempera, ride or shoe a horse, compose a poem, cobble a shoe, catch and clean a fish, fish, set a snare, cook a pheasant to perfection, build a model folly or fortress. In short, there was almost nothing the remarkable boy could not do, and it was commonly supposed that he must carry exalted blood within his veins, as no other explanation for such unserf like talents appeared to exist. The Marquis had taken note. It occurred to his lordship that the young prodigy's abilities, so potentially profitable of use, should be cultivated. Thus, Dref Zinosan had been granted the almost unbelievable privilege of an exalted education. He had taken his instruction alongside the Marquise's own daughter, questioned her tutors, devoured the contents of the manor library, and then proceeded to secure of additional volumes of his own by bartering with the visiting peddlers. He had even gone so far as to assist the bright but inattentive little Elise with her lessons. He was seven years older and infinitely more knowledgeable than she. During the earliest years of her education, Elise had loved and admired him to the point of idolatry. She had followed him everywhere about the estate, quoted his sayings, nagged him continually to play at blue cat with her. A little later on, of course, she had come to recognize his inferior status, and admiration inevitably dwindled. The reproof and ridicule of family members alerted her to the impropriety of her affection. She was, they informed her, growing up, and a young lady, a daughter of Vaudereval, did not run wild and barefoot through the woods in the company of serfs. A Vaudereval (laughs) chose her friends among her equals, carried herself with dignity, and, above all, never forgot her position. Unless, of course, she preferred to live among serfs. If she preferred it, Elise was certainly quite free to leave the chateau, to march on down the lane to the little smoke-filled, sweat-smelling cottages where the serfs dwelt amidst their fleas, and there she might make her home beneath a moldy thatched roof. Quite likely she'd be happy in such a setting, 
what with her affinity for serfs. They teach her how to till the soil, shovel dung, scrub floors, eat offal, and pick lice. She might take her cup and dish when she went, but not the silver spoon engraved with her name and family crest, because it was obvious a mistake had been made. She could not be Elise Faux Daraval, daughter to his lordship. Clearly she must be some low-born impostor. A peasant's whelp switched at birth with the Marquise's child. Only this child, only this could explain her attitude and behavior. Eventually the little girl's worst tendencies were corrected. Newfound comprehension of her own rank was marked by an increase in self-conscious dignity. Familiarity on the part of inferiors was no longer tolerated. At age eight, Elise Vauderval was a very haughty young lady indeed, much given to verbal and physical rebuke of servants. It did not last long, of course. Before much time passed, she had developed the easy confidence, the sense of serene native superiority characteristic of her class. Conspicuous self-assertion gave, gave way to a more relaxed assurance, and she adopted the air of casually authoritative kindness to which most underlings responded so well. Most, but not all, and never dreff. Difficult to assume an air of careless superiority with him. He had ways of making her feel ridiculous whenever she tried it. Her assumptions of assault exalted dignity were wont to provoke the sarcasm for which, as he as he well knew, she would not have him punished. Old attachments died hard, and she could not rid herself of her affection for Dreff, but it was a mistake to let him know it. He was apt to presume. Really, he was entirely too free in his manner, addressing her without deference as if he imagined himself her equal, or even her intellectual better, more experienced and more knowledgeable than she. In all conscience, she ought not tolerate it. Her weak indulgence only encouraged his insolence. And there, even at a distance, the insolence proclaimed in his proclaimed itself in his upright carriage, in the free swing of his long stride, in the unsuitably proud lift of his dark head. It was difficult to put into words, but somehow, but something about Drefsinoson's very appearance was subtly, was subtly offensive to exalted sensibilities. Like his sister, Dref was taller than a serf ought to be. His legs were too long, his figure too attenuated, agile rather than powerful, his features too chiseled, lean, sharp-jawed face, too mobile, too expressive, sometimes dangerously so, hands too fine and adroit, too well-tended, no black semicircles under the short nails, no embedded grime. Unlike the typical surf, Dref Zinosan was fond of bathing. Whether permitting a plunge in the pond, he contrived to keep himself clean, thus obviating the need for costly perfume to which he would in any case have had no access. But Dreff, she reminded herself, would have obtained perfume if he had ever wanted it. If he couldn't get it by barter, he'd have concocted his own using flowers, herbs, oils, and extracts, whatever came most readily to hand. Dreff was like that. The young man's lack of ordinary peasant stench was refreshing, but subtly presumptuous. A cart horse should not resemble a race horse, and a serf's style should not ape that of his betters. He had dressed in his best for the occasion, she noted. He had abandoned his patched yellow-gray smock in favor of a shirt of white linen, coarse but clean and decent. Over it, he wore a short jacket and neckerchief. In place of his usual baggy pantaloons, he wore knee breeches and a pair of threadbare white stockings. The hideous wooden sabots he had, had given way to hand-me-down leather shoes with steel buckles carefully cleansed of rust. The scrupulously neat appearance, intended as a mark of respect, was ill-timed. He looked too spruce, too independent, too indefinably uppish, 
Just now, the Marquise Vauderaval would only resent the effrontery. He looked up, saw her waiting there, and waved. She returned the salute, smiling, and watched without moving as he made his way across the lawn and mounted the old stone steps. An instant later, he was bowing low before her. All very well, in theory, but somehow it came off wrong, like so many of his ostensibly servile gestures. Serfs and peasants were wont to bob like arthritic drunkards, shoulders hunched, knees stiffed, arms either locked or dangling limp limply. But Dreff, with his spare, loose-jointed frame, could make a leg worthy of a dancing master. Sometimes it seemed as if those fa faultless courtesies were almost burlesque in their perfection, almost insolent in their fluid grace, or so it looked to Elise, who knew him. Perhaps no one else had ever noticed. And yes, he was doing it now, bending just a satiric shade lower than propriety demanded. He straightened, and she spoke without thinking. Why don't you just grow a forelock and tug it? That would suffice, and you wouldn't need to bow. But I prefer to bow. It's a splendidly expressive gesture. His voice was pleasantly low and his speech singular. The excellent grammar and literate fluency were incongruously linked with the drawling accent of a northern provincial peasant. I know. Too expressive. I'd take care if I were you. Gladly. How shall I achieve perfect discretion? Perfect impertinence is more your style, but you will never achieve it, being wholly imperfect. Then my constant imperfection achieves a perfect consistency, thus destroying its own constancy and preserving perfect imperfection. Serfs should not aspire to paradox. To what shall we aspire beyond subservience? Oh, she considered, loyalty, duty, reliability. So much you demand your, your horses and dogs. Nothing more. Honesty? Unfailing amiability? You ladle out a sorry mess of watered gruel. A malcontent might think so, but simple fare is most nutritious, you'll grant. Come, your imagination lags. What more? Humility, she suggested helpfully. Proper respect for your betters. How shall I know them? The judgments of nature and society rarely coincide. It's hardly your place to make the distinction. Burdened as I am with eyes and a brain, how shall I avoid it? Don't be impudent. Surely I have not offended, he inquired with intolerable solicitude. Oh, you won't offend me. I hardly take you so seriously. But don't try your nonsense on anyone else, or you are looking for trouble. It's never necessary to look for trouble. It comes unsought and unwelcome as your father's tax collector in autumn. And like my father's tax collector, tarries with the, with the refractory. And to prolong the conceit, most abuses those capable of self-defense. <laughs> those incapable of self-defense. The innocent need hardly fear abuse. There you reveal your own ignorant in innocence, child. Ignorance? Innocence? Child? How dare you? Take that back, Dreff, she stamped her foot. You just take that back. I do. What could I have been thinking of? I am deeply sorry. I will never call you innocent again. Still, I must note certain exceptions to the sterling principles you've cited. Take Zan Zubason, for example. Your sister's intended, the young firebrand. Scarcely such a desperate character. Only a harmless idealist with a childish penchant for forbidden political tracts, unworthy of your father's notice. I'm inclined to agree. I gather you are here to speak on this Zen's behalf. He nodded. Don't do it. His brows rose, and she added, it's the wrong time. As I told your sister a few minutes ago, my father has worked himself into a fine rage over this foolish little affair. 
Already he regrets his mistake in permitting even occasional literacy among the serfs. Seeing you here now, unsummoned, absent from your work without permission, dressed above your station, assuming airs as you always do, will only add fuel to the fire. You'd best keep out of it, Dreff. I should like nothing better. Poor Zen is a particular friend of mine, however, as well as my sister's intended, and he requires assistance. The lad is hardly capable of defending himself. Well, I've promised to drop a word in my father's ear. Have you? I am relieved. He had abandoned his bantering tone for once. His eyes, large, brilliant, as black as Stelly's, reflected unwanted concern. Zen might hope for no better advocate. In recent years, he had adopted toward her an air of sardonic, exaggerated deference, and she had grown used to it. Now, in the face of this unexpected earnestness, rem reminiscent of the dress she remembered from childhood, she found herself uneasy, even embarrassed, and she replied hastily, "'Clearly, I've warned your sister. There's no guarantee I'll succeed.' I pray that you do, else young Zen stands to suffer, and he is not strong. Still disquiet, disquietingly grave, and she felt a momentary pang, something akin to guilt or shame, quickly dispelled by annoyance. She was a little bored, she decided, and more than a little regretful that she had stooped to involve herself in a trifling concern of inferiors. Now she shrugged and answered coldly, Really, I don't see why you and that sister of yours persist in exaggerating the importance of this incident. If Zen Zupasan, or whatever the lot's name is, receives a whipping, is that so dreadful? No doubt his skin is thick. He'll feel little. In any case, he wants discipline. He was deliberately disobedient, and punishment may serve to correct his faults. Ah, uh, would it correct yours, I wonder? No need now to complain of his gravity. His teeth flashed white against his sun-bronzed face in a smile she found somehow unsettling. Mine? What do you mean? Perhaps you have none. But let us assume for the sake of argument that his lordship's daughter is not without flaw. Would a good hiding, publicly administered and followed by a healthy sojourn in the pillory, improve her character? Very good, buffoon! Perhaps you have presumed to read the wrong book, or you have spoken too freely, or failed to pay your taxes on time, or even ventured beyond the boundaries of the seigneur's estate without permission. Then surely you want discipline, and punishment is indicated. It is for your own good, after all. How absurd you are! Truly droll! But what folly to suggest that the restrictions governing the lower orders ought to apply to me, or indeed to any member of the exalted, we are hardly of the same clay. Are you quite sure of that? Is the difference among men so very great? In the opinion of certain natural philosophers, the so-called magical powers of the exalted, which we have been taught to fear, are extinct, or exhausted, or at best aberrant. Then your natural philosophers are natural fools. What of my uncle Quinn's? Doesn't he possess magic? Beyond question. Dreff admitted. But he is not extraordinary. Um, but is he not extraordinary, almost unique? <laughs> oh, I'm sure not, she returned carelessly. In any case, there you are. There is your living proof of the innate difference between the exalted and the common sort. As for applying the same laws to each, you, ought w you might with equal justice demand identical rights for sheep and shepherd. Well, little shepherdess, no doubt you'll tend your flock with care to the greater glory of all who love to feed upon mutton. Comedian, she exclaimed, a little nettled. Then she looked into the black eyes, whose, whose expression she found she could not read, and it occurred to her that her analogy, intended only as a natural observation of obvious fact, might have offended him, might even have caused him pain. Instantly contrite, she strove to make amends. But you mustn't think that I say, that what I say applies to you, Dreff. You're different, most unusual, and everyone knows it. You are so clever, so ingenious, you rise entirely above your station. 
everyone suspects you of exalted ancestry. Indeed, but for an accident of birth, you might almost be one of us. There, that should make things right. The highest praise, and every word of it true. He did not look mollified, however. He was smiling, yes, but she recognized that expression. It meant trouble. I must own myself unworthy of such honor. My veins are scarcely graced as you suggest. He spoke slowly, broadening his vowels and slurring his R's and deliberate exaggeration of his natural peasant drawl to her annoyance. I am nothing more than I appear, and thus says worthy of contempt, oppression, and exploitation as every other member of my class. Poor Dreff, do you know what your trouble is? She allowed him no time to answer. He was not going to get the better of her this time. You cannot accept reality. Nothing is ever good enough for you. You persist in railing against mankind, society, the world, and everything in it. No doubt the sun, moon, and stars likewise fail to meet your standards. Thus you grumble of tyranny, cruelty, oppression, and exploitation. Well, perhaps a few of the exalted might have abused their privileges from time to time. We are not perfect, after all. But where is the remedy? The exalted, endowed with special qualities, suited by nature to govern and to guide, merely perform their natural function in the world. Would you do away with a ruling class, thus abolishing government? Would you free the populace to run wild to the destruction of civilization? Do you prize unbridled license above peace and security, above life itself? There must be leadership, rule and order, to ensure the general good else chaos overwhelms us all. Is that what you want? Her eyes were dancing as she concluded. She had him pinned, she was certain. I must admire the facility with which you parrot the sounding phrases gleaned at your father's table. Alas, that a retentive memory is in itself no substitute for reason. Ignoring her affronted scowl, he continued, has it never occurred to you that stable government and exalted ascendancy aren't necessarily synonymous, or that questionable existence of certain peculiar abilities doesn't necessarily mark a natural ruling class, or that the judicious restriction of exalted president privilege needn't herald the onset of anarchy? Well, she shrugged, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but history teaches us differently. History was never your strong subject, little Ellie he remarked, and she glanced at him in surprise, for he hadn't presumed to employ that diminutive in years. He must have been more agitated, agitated than she'd realized to let it slip out. You have forgotten that the nation of Vonar has not always been the absolute monarchy that it is today. In earlier times, the power of king was limited, and the subjugation of the peasant class correspondingly incomplete. The ordinary laborer enjoyed a degree of personal freedom unknown in our day. In fact, it was not until the time of the dread scourge epidemic, that is, scarcely 200 years ago, that laws were passed binding peasant to soil, thus establishing our happy modern condition of serfdom. Needless to say, matters did not end there, and now, in an era that unaccountably prides itself upon its enlightenment, an exalted landowner is legally free to imprison, chastise, mutilate, or even execute his own serfs without fear of outside intervention. Most serfs aren't badly off. The lazy ones like to complain, that's all. Elise was growing bored and uncomfortable. Why couldn't he have confined himself to the usual bad badinage? It was so much more enjoyable. You are insufferable. Worse, you grow tedious. Then I will conclude quickly. It goes without saying that the exalted master rules all circumstances of his humans, ca human cattle's lives, from birth, at which time the infant serf is marked the symbol identifying him as man or property, through childhood, during which the youngster is schooled in servility, while access to formal education is customarily denied, through adolescence, wherein labor or craft is chosen and assigned at the seigneur's pleasure, through 
adulthood, wherein seigneurial permission is required to marry, to build a cottage, dig a well, or plant a private vegetable garden through old age, whose advent is generally accelerated by want, hardship, and hopelessness, and finally unto death itself, at which time the unspeakable corpse privilege grants the seigneur the right to dispose of the serf's mortal remains, to grind them as dog's meat, should he see fit. That is offensive and revolting. No one would ever dream of doing such a thing, and you know it. Do I? It must not be supposed. Dreff continued dryly, that signorial authority limits itself to the trifles I have touched upon. Throughout the course of an impoverished and generally miserable life, the serf, together with the supposedly free peasant, continually toils, only to see the best fruits of his efforts harvested by the seigneur. The instruments of despoilation is the tax, of which an impressive assortment exists. There is the well tax, the oven tax, the mill tax, the bottle tax, the right-of-way tax, the seed tax, field tax, vine tax, orchard tax, old age ushers in infirmity, and the loss of labor tax. I could go on at length, but there is no point in naming them all. Suffice it to say, there exists no aspect of the peasant's life untouched and unspoiled by the rapacity of his oppressors. His youth and strength are commodities owned by his lord. He labors from dawn to dusk to pay the price of exalted luxury, while his own children suffer hunger and cold. He owes, owns no voice in the formation of the laws that chain him, though they govern every breath he draws from birth to death. In the eyes of the law, he is scarcely more than a draft animal. Yet woe to the serf who thinks to better his lot by fleeing the estate of his master. Outlaw and outcast, hunted and despised, friendless and facing starvation, the beaten wretch generally comes crawling on back to his kennel within days. In the unlikely event that he fails to do so, no matter, the mark he bears upon his flesh will betray him, ensuring his swift recapture. Smiling thinly, Dreff glanced at his own right hand, the back of which bore a black tattooed letter D identifying him as a Daravel serf. Elise felt the color flame in her cheeks. For a moment, confusion and an odd sense of mortification held her tongue-tied. Almost she moved to clasp the blemished hand, and the foolish impulse added to her discomfort. She felt herself somehow blameworthy, and the sensation was so disagreeable that she sought refuge in anger, how dare he presume to reproach her? How dare he? His complaints actually verged on accusation. Unbelievable that a serf should speak thus to her. Outrageous, and not to be borne. Lifting her chin, she answered with an affection of cold, affectation of cold boredom. I assume there is some point to this prolonged, tiresome recital? The point is only this that the rule of a king and his exalted is neither a law of nature nor yet of historical inevitability. Change is quite possible. This true, the systemic victimization of the populace over the course of centuries builds a debt of blood and pain that may be repaid with interest one day. And what is that supposed to mean? Sufficiently goaded, even the meanest of slaves are capable of turning on their masters, at which point the demands for justice and for vengeance become indistinguishable. It is something in your peers might wish to consider. For a moment she stared at him astonished, then trilled an artificial little laugh. <laughs> My, how earnest you look! How grim and funny! It's not like you at all. I see now why my father banned the writings of such self-proclaimed sages at your Shorvi, as your Shorvi Nerian. He was right to do so, for these rabble-rouses are making a dreary pedant of you. Education can do that. Shall I say what yours is making of you? That's enough, her precarious coolness broke. You go too far, and I won't listen to any more. It's stupid and boring, and if you spoke this way to anyone else in my family, they'd order you whipped. Ah, the great panacea. No doubt we'll witness its salutary effects upon Zen Shubasan. That again. 
I'm not interested. The creature can bleed for all I care. No, I don't mean that. I take it back. She paused a moment to compose herself. Dreff was watching her expressionlessly. For some reason, he seemed to delight in baiting her today. He was in an odd humor, certainly. But she wasn't about to give him the satisfaction of seeing her lose her temper. When she spoke again, her manner was carefully careless. I will speak to my father about your friend, as I promised. Having received the assurance you came for, you're, you've my leave to withdraw. You are not amusing today, and I've truly little interest in continuing a wearisome conversation. Turning with disdainful, with a disdainful switch of her skirts, Elise flounced into the house. Dreff stood looking after her until a tiny flash of motion caught his eye, and he turned to the great woodpile that bulked beside the doorway. A crouching figure rose, and his sister stepped forth from her hiding place behind the, leaped, the heaped logs. Don't look so surprised, Stelly advised. I've always wanted to hear what goes on between you and Princess Snot. Hush, Stelly. You'll only make things worse. Don't hush me. You're no better than me. What I want to know is, what are you going to do about my zen? If you've been listening, then you already know. Elise has agreed to intercede with her father on Zen's behalf. And you believe it? That mincing little bitch won't trouble herself on our account, you may be sure. I want you to talk to the Marquise. You're a real good talker, and you promised. So I did, but this way is better. Elise's intervention will be far more effective than mine could ever be. Trust her, she'll do her best. Her best's none too good, since she cares for nobody but her own self. If you don't, th if you think she's a friend of yours, you're an ass for all your precious learning. I don't trust her, and I, and I won't trust you either if you don't do what you promised. You've got to speak up. Zen's your friend, and you owe him. Thank you for listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories podcast. We hope you've enjoyed it. And that you have a lovely, relaxing evening. Thank you.